Well, that's, I mean, that's the thing. It's sort of, I don't know. Um, well, welcome, though, again to another Bob the Father. Uh, we have one person here, but uh, we also have our Zoom open. So if anyone wants to join us on Zoom, more than happy, more than welcome to do that. Uh, this might be a short uh, meeting, but uh, wh whatever, it's fine. Um, is there, I mean, this is actually my, I, I'm doing Father the Father tomorrow for the sixth, the fifth graders, too. So, I mean, this is really kind of a first session anyway. Um, yeah, yeah. I also maybe just show people, I'm sharing sure my screen on Zoom. Um, you know, I like to use different resources for these things. And uh, I find that uh, the, the, you only really need three real resources for any question may come up. I say that in general. I mean, there's obviously going to be more questions that may not be in those, those uh, references. Obviously, like the Summa is a great reference. The writings of uh, some of the great saints, which will be St. Augustine. Uh, even philosophy like Socrates and Aristotle. It's always good to have some reference on hand, but for the most part, I use the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is found on the Vatican webpage here. Um, the Code of Canon Law, which is also found on the, the Vatican webpage, and um, the Bible, which is found on, I, I find USCCB has a great link to all the books of the Bible if you want to look those up for a quick reference. Um, so if anyone's in a pinch ever, or needs, you know, needs maybe an answer to some question might be pressing. Um, yeah, go to the internet, you know, pull up Google or whatever on your phone or, you know, on, on your on your uh, laptop or, you know, PC, whatever. And the nice thing about these, they're kind of had spelled out by um, chapter for the, the catechism. And basically the, the whole catechism is kind of set up in different um, topics. So you can kind of scroll down and see the topics themselves and click on the, uh, the section that really best, uh, you know, corresponds to the answer. Same with the code, code of Canon Law. It kind of breaks it up into different topics as well. Um, these are more articles and titles, but I mean, for instance, uh, there's a, a whole uh, title just on the sacraments. So you can like look at that stuff. Um, what the purpose of the people of God are. This is a Canon Law. And so they start actually with some theological statements. The Code of Canon Law starts, every section starts with a, a theological statement, and then the laws kind of flow from there. So, uh, and then of course, uh, the USCCB webpage, the books, the Bible are, are just kind of, you know, it's all 72. If you know the chapter verse, or if you need to like look up, look it up, at least know the book, you can look those up online. So um, I'm going to share that with you, just to kind of get some understanding what the references are. Maybe uh, well, there's a lot of good references online, especially on the Vatican webpage. Um, the other thing on the Vatican webpage they have is uh, documents from the popes from all the different um, um, cyclicals have put out there. Um, another great reference I have, which I really advise anyone who's really serious about learning more about the church, is um, this book from uh, Denzinger. It was called The Compendium of the Catholic Church. Um, and what's in there is like all the statements from the different ecumenical councils of since the very first one in Nicaea. So it kind of have references about what was said there, what the, what the, um, uh, anathemas would have been what the what the edicts would have been and so it's actually that's actually a very handy reference i don't think there's an online version of that i think it's just denzinger d-e-n-i-z-e-n-g-e-r denzinger um that's that was a great reference i used all through seminary because you know when you're writing papers and stuff and you're like well i wonder what the i don't know what the council of chalcedon said about that you can go look it up pretty easily um I found that a very handy reference. I don't know. I, I think it was like $60 um, in any bookstore. Probably if you go to a used bookstore, probably cheaper. Um, but you go like Paul, the Pauli books or Catholic Spies, probably around that 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 price range. But it's, I mean, it may be worth it. I, I, I appreciate that very much, just having that reference because it does help out uh, trying to find references for, for different things. So good. Um, well, if we don't have any questions, at least we've got that. So that's good. Uh, we're also out on the patio. So if you're in the area, want to come up and join us, feel free. Um, any questions? <laughs> Who, uh, how are um, priests? Uh, how is the tribunal? Uh, how are they elected to serve on that? And how many right. people are yeah. on that? Um, okay, so 
I'm assuming you mean like a local tribunal, not yeah. like what they call the Rota. Yeah. In, uh, okay. Like here, let's say. I mean, in real, in real, it's the same. But yeah, here in the Archdiocese, um, there's really like no limit on how many judges or advocates can sit on the tribunal. So um, we kind of have this broken down. There are um, the, 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 the function of the uh, different functionaries of the tribunal are judges, of course, which kind of make the calls. You have a uh, defender. Oh, what's, what's right or I mean, what's how, what they, decision will be? Right, okay. right. So, so uh, the judges kind of take, they are dispent, um, they are um, delegated authority by the bishop. So they represent the archbishop in these, in these matters and making canonical uh, decisions. Okay. The bishop couldn't do that too. So bishop is automatically a judge. He's the highest authority. He's like the highest appeal. He can make, like can, he can overrule any other judge's decision. So he's kind of like the final say. Now, the other, the other thing you do is if, if, if you don't get a good uh, verdict from the archbishop, you can take it to the Roman Rota, which is in Rome. Right. So you can actually have the judges there decide it or the pope himself. Every Catholic has that right. So uh, now, obviously, it doesn't usually get that far, uh, typically. But uh, every Catholic has the right to appeal to the Holy Father on these canonical decisions. But the judges are typically priests, but it could be lay people too, or consecrated, who've had uh, special canon, canon law training. So on Sr. Shamlet, for instance, he is trained as a canon lawyer. He is a judge of the second instance. So he used to be the judicial vicar, um, but now that he has a parish and other things to do. He is now taking the role of the judge of the second instance, sort of like the appeals court. So uh, in the cases of, let's say, uh, <clears throat> a um, annulment. Let's say a verdict comes from the first instance that is uh, not uh, appreciated or not, not, uh, not maybe the way that the, the respondent or the uh, petitioner wants. So they can go to the, the appeal it to the court of the second instance. And Monsignor and some of his peers, another of his peers, uh, would look at that case and see if there's a, a, a um, grounds for appealing the case and if not you go to the archbishop and if not that you can go to rome and all the way up to the holy father um <clears throat> most of the time it gets doesn't get too past the support second instance in more modern contemporary times uh back in the day it probably could have happened several times to go to rome depending on what was going on but um that's kind of how the way it works so you have the judges you have a uh, defender of the bond who's also a canon lawyer um, and this is primarily for like annulment cases, but this could be for any type of case. There's always like a defense and a prosecutor, right? So in annulment cases specifically, a canon lawyer who is trained to be defend the point of view of the sanctity of the marriage. So they're kind of saying, no, this is still a valid marriage and here are the reasons why. And then you have the advocate who is really representing uh, the, either the petitioner or the respondent in the case uh, for annulment. Uh, who's kind of like their, uh, you know, prosecutor, I guess. Right. Um, now, there are other cases, too, like uh, cases of um, valid ordination or um, cases of um, maybe um, uh, defrocking or, you know, uh, the uh, 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 legalization. Those also go through the same court of appeals, usually. <clears throat> but typically, some, most of the time, they don't go that route because the archbishop or the bishop is up within determines the best case for the best way forward for those type of situations. Primarily, you see annulment uh, cases in the tribunal, but there are other things that the tribunal can decide. Um, and usually, that, that's kind of how it works. There's a defender, a prosecutor, and a judge, the appeals court. I think. Now, <clears throat> how many can be on the tribunal? There really is no limit. Um, that's kind of determined by the archbishop or the bishop. Uh, who's picked? That's also at the discretion of the bishop or the archbishop. So, they could say, you know, Father Madden, uh, you're doing such a great job, job of St. Gabriel. And uh, we would like you to go for some special training to become a candidate lawyer. So everybody has to have some pretty basic knowledge of... Yeah, so every every law. yeah every priest is eligible to be an advocate, at least, because we've had that, that can, canonical training. Uh -huh. And so, like, I'm an advocate. I think all my classmates are trained as advocates. So, like, we're all on that list to be an advocate for somebody. And most priests are. 
<clears throat> but to be like a, a judge or like one of those other special um, uh, positions, you have to go for, for more training than right, right. Office, right? Yeah, right. Um, and usually that's going to be like a master's at least. Some most most judges get a doctorate uh, in canon law, and so uh, you probably have to at least get that in order to be in those positions. And so that could be an extra two, maybe even three or four years of, of school. Um, usually we send people to Rome, but like my senior went to Montreal. I mean, it just kind of depends on where the bishop wants to send you. It's almost like going back to seminary in many ways. It's like, well, where do you want to go to the seminary? You know, um, we don't have that capacity here at Kenrick, so we have to find another school. It, has to be, it also has to be a pontifical degree. So a pontifical degree is those that are, are sanctioned by Rome. And there really aren't, aren't too many pontifical universities. I, for instance, here in, in the United States, we only have two. Um, Catholic University of America and uh, Mundelein Line Seven in Chicago. Um, Kenrick, I think, is trying to get some um, rights in that capacity. Like just recently, they were able to give, uh, what was it, um, baccalaureate um, pontifical degrees, but they can't give like, what they call as licentiates, which is really the, what you really want in these cases. So I think they're working towards that, but they're not there yet. Because they'd have to have professors. Like well, they have to be, yeah, the professor would have to be uh, uh, monitored and, and approved by the Vatican. Yeah. Which, I mean, is not out of realm possibility. And even, <laughs> I know before I left, uh, the uh, there was a <clears throat> representative from the Gregorian University over in Rome, Jesuit, uh, who would do regular uh, checkups on, on Kenrick just for giving the baccalaureate license. And he made comments like, you know, I don't know why you'd ever send to Rome. You have such great information here. <laughs> so, so they do a good work at Kenrick. They really do. And so I think that might be on the horizon. You might see that happening here maybe in the next decade. I don't know. Um, but I don't know if they'll be giving out licenses for canon law. That that all remains to be seen. So that, but that's kind of how the process works. You have to get a special degree, special training. And then you have to be appointed by the Archbishop. Now, the Roman Rota is sort of a different animal. It's kind of the same process, but typically on the Roman Rota, you wouldn't see a lot of lay um, judges or lay advocates. Where, in, you know, in the tribunal in St. Louis, anyone could be, as long as they're trained properly, anyone could be an advocate, uh, lay or not. Um, and really, even lay people could be judges, because they can also get licentiates in Canada Law, too. Um, but that just kind of depends. And the Roman Rota, typically they're cardinals that are on this, in those positions. That makes that makes sense too, because you know, if the Pope is the one, if they're representing the Pope, it probably should be someone like that. Good. Yeah, it's just kind of fascinating. I I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> I have some friends of mine who I wouldn't mind being canon lawyers. I don't know. I mean, I could take it or leave it. I've, 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 I've been the advocate for a few tri uh, tribunal cases already, and yeah, it's kind of. I mean, it's it's good in some respect. Part of a part of the 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 challenge and sometimes the fun in it, especially with like uh, annulment cases, is trying to figure out how the bond was never established. Because canon law has a lot of different. Um, ways you could say that a marriage is not valid um there's kind of a myriad myriad amount I mean, as a matter of fact some of the uh we have some uh parishioners who've been trained to be um uh, mentors so we have a mentor mentor couples in the parish that i know i use a lot of my couples and i think my senior trying to use too um and i get questions all the time from them about like well, we're having this discussion about validity of marriage you know, they come with some very interesting questions. Uh, I think we covered one of them uh, in one of these sessions a while back about the Josephite marriages. Right? That was a question that was brought up by one of the uh, one of the mentor, mentor couples. So, um, yeah, they have some really good questions sometimes. And a lot of this, like, yeah, I don't know, you got to think about that a little bit. And you have to look what the canon law says and kind of like, okay, well, um, how do you interpret that too? Uh, one thing I find with canon law, it's a lot open to interpretation. So, like, it's funny, you could ask, like, you know, Monsignor Shamleffer and maybe another, uh, you know, three other canon lawyers, 
and get three different opinions about the way forward. So I always miss Monsieur. He usually Monsieur has never let me wrong so far, so I usually listen to what he has to say. But uh, it is kind of fascinating to uh, to look recount along and kind of like, well, you guys can interpret it this way or this way. Um, like one of one of the aspects which I think is kind of fascinating, it talks about maturity level. So uh, could you argue that an eight two eighteen year olds who got married, um, and let's say twenty years later they're looking to dissolve the marriage, could you argue that they were not mature enough to make that decision at eighteen? I think you could. You know, I think in this generation especially, you could probably say that. Now, going back to the 40s around the World War II, I mean, that was happening quite a lot, right? You have these people are going off to war, so people at 18 were getting married right, you know, right away. And what's kind of fascinating, a lot of those marriages lasted. Um, but even then, could you say if someone wanted to seek annulment, could you say, well, maybe they weren't mature enough? Well, they're not no, no different than any of their peers. Uh, a lot of it depends on the circumstances they find themselves in. Um, but even uh, recent studies in, in science have shown that a, a person's brain does not develop fully until their mid twenties. So could you say we well, yeah, they didn't have the capacity to make that mature decision at that age, and that could be grounds to say well, yeah, because of per canon whatever they weren't mature enough to make that call. That's been used a few times, and I don't know if that was the main reason why the old was given, but that's a factor. So there should really be consoles against getting married that young. You know? Well, see, and again, that's why I think it depends on the circumstances because there could be a couple 18-year-olds who are very mature, right? And they know what they're getting into. What, what the church wants for, for marriage preparation for, for people, and there are certain requirements. You have to be at least 16 and all that good stuff and 18 for the law of the United States. Um, but all we really want is sufficient preparation and just have them understand what they're getting into. And so, uh, like with my couples, I meet with them between four and six meetings between the, the our starting with meeting. And I also have them meet with these uh, uh, mentor couples about six times because I want them to understand, like, this is what you're saying yes to. And I want this to be not only a valid, but also a sacramental marriage, meaning God's working here, right? Um, so, that's really what it comes down to. And I mean, I hope that's kind of happening now. I don't know. I mean, the struggle, I think, as someone who's preparing someone for marriage is you have to open the possibility of being lied to, right? Maybe, I know, when, I'm say, when I say that, you know, uh, it may not be a good idea for three guys to live together before marriage because not only does re those, the data show that that doesn't really work out too well for marriage, but also from a, just a, a standpoint of rationale, you know, there's really no more courtship now, right? Because are you guys just going through the motions? And if, if you feel compelled to get married because now you're living together, that could be grounds to say you're not validly married. You know, I guess if you come back and say like 10 years later, well, yeah, we were living together and I just felt we had to like take the next step. I felt compelled to do that. Well, that wasn't a free choice. That wasn't a free yes of giving yourself. And so therefore you could say the marriage is invalid. <laughs> now there are legitimate reasons why you say someone can live together before. I mean part of that could be financial part of that could be medical issues um, so you could say but even then I would say you know I, I'm trusting that you are living as brother and sister here and not engaging in the marital act before marriage now are they? I don't know I mean I'm not naive enough to say they're not but that's also why I say the sacrament of confession is available to you, to you any, any time so, uh, yeah, I mean, I've had, boy, I think I've had about 20 merit weddings so far. So 20 couples, but more, actually more than that, of training, like I've been prepped. And right now I have about eight couples I'm working with. And, yeah, I mean, I, for the most part, I think they've all been pretty good. There's been some couples I've worked with that seems like there's some red flags, and we've discussed those. But, um, yeah, you always have the open possibility that you're being lied to. And so when I witness a marriage, I'm trusting that I've done the best I could to train them, that they are receiving it and understand what they're saying yes to, and that when they say yes to each other and give that consent, that's a valid and sacramental marriage for those who are married. But I don't know. That's, that's, that's one of the struggles, like, in the sacrament of marriage, because I know when I administer a sacrament, 
I know I have the intent of doing that. When it comes to um, marriage, the struggle there is I'm not the minister of the sacrament. So I can't say for sure if the intention is there or not because I just don't know. Um, yeah, so it kind of makes for some very interesting, you know, situations later in uh, when the, when uh, the moment's time to come. So yeah, I don't know. And that's the other thing too. You don't want to get to that point. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, you don't want you don't want them to. I mean, that's not that that's not a good thing. You know. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't. Tell you the truth, I don't even talk about annulments. Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, when I when I'm prepping for a person for marriage, I don't even bring it up. Now they may bring it up with a with mentor couple. I don't know, but um, because that's not the goal. But I'm right. looking at okay. Here's what makes it your marriage valid, sacramental, and, and illicit, and that's what I want for you. And so uh, here's ways you can actually understand and also a lot of it grow. Uh, but I don't even approach an annulments in my discussion with them. So if a couple, one of the party is Catholic and the other is not, can they have a mass? Uh, yeah, they could. Religion? They yeah. could. I mean, most, I think, in, usually in those situations, um, like I'm having a wedding uh, this weekend where, uh, actually I actually have two weddings a weekend. One's a mass because both are, are, Catholic, are Catholic. And one is just going to be the service because one of the parties is not. So kind of the, <clears throat> the rationale there would be well, is there anybody on your side who can actually receive the Eucharist or not? I mean, because it, it, it's sort of exclusive. If you're, if, you know, if half the congregation comes to receive the Eucharist, the other half is not. And so in that respect, you say, well, maybe it's best just to do the ceremony. Which is fine. I mean, it's still, still valid, still, you know, works. Um, there is maybe a, a conversation about conversion that usually happens at that point, you know, are you willing to convert? Are you open to that? But even those instances, let's say like if someone's a convert, because uh, I've had this happen too, where there's a convert, uh, recent convert, but the rest of the family is not Catholic. So in those circumstances, you'd be like, well, you know, you guys are though. I try to argue, I always try to argue for the mass rather than not. Um, but in this circumstance where the, the one party is not Catholic, one party is, I usually say, you know, that's okay if you want to do it this way. Um, but if both parties are Catholic, I think it's probably best to have the Mass than not. Even if your family's like a couple received, you are. And this is a kind of a, there's a great symbolism involved in that as, you know, a bride takes his, uh, a groom takes his bride, Christ takes his church, and we receive that in the Eucharist. <clears throat> so I always try to argue for that in those circumstances. But yeah, I've had a few where it's just a ceremony because you know, one party's not Catholic. Okay. But also, I've also had it where there was a mass where the party was not Catholic, because the Catholic party really wouldn't have a mass. Like, great, good, yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah, usually I have that discussion early on, yeah. just because um, my standpoint is, uh, well, if you want, if you don't want to have a mass, it's probably no. I shouldn't say it this way. <clears throat> it's probably not it's not completely necessary for me to be there so i usually maybe in those circumstances maybe engage the deacon to maybe you know do the prep for them or even do the, the maybe not do the prep maybe do the, the actual marriage portion um just because the deacon, that's the deacon's function they can do that too right. and unless there is a mass i mean yeah i could be there but i mean why <laughs> Uh, I don't know if that's the best way to look at it, but like like this one happened this weekend. I think, what happened with that? I think we initially talked about Mass, but then over the course of time, we decided, yeah, you know, this decided is a Catholic. I was like, okay. So at that point, it was sort of like too far in. But I've been asked that question more front with my couples when they come to me. Um, <clears throat> what's kind of funny here is there's a lot of couples that approach me that aren't in the parish. So, uh, the last two people, I've, two couples I've talked to, they were like, yeah, you know, so one was because St. Ambrose was booked that day. 
and the other one I think was just because well they like to look at the church and when they have it. Sure, right. and I was like, okay, <laughs> but usually I tr I try to persuade them to find someone else to do the prep just because unless you're gonna stay here and engage in the parish, yeah. I mean, I'm I, if you have nobody else, fine, I'll be there for you. But unless you're going to be part of this community, it doesn't really make a lot of sense yeah. even to have the wedding here, personally. Right. But, um, and then the parish, and they'll say, well, mine won't be in the parish. It's just a stop and eat because they like the church. You know? and, uh, yeah, and there was there was one last year. It happened the same way. Though. I think the, the woman, they lived over in Illinois. He was in the military. And she, I think, was just going around different churches and seeing what they did. And she was here, and the, it was like Sunday afternoon. She came in and talked to me. I was like, "Well, oh, okay, well, all right. Are you gonna be part of this community?" He's like, "Well, we went to him. Like, where you live now, Illinois?" I'm like, "Are you planning like move?" Like, <laughs> it's like we're in the military. We're like, "Okay, well." And because of that, I mean, since it was kind of transitory, I was like, "Well, oh, fine," you know. But um, yeah, I usually I try to <clears throat> try to uh, have them be engaged in some way. So. Okay. Okay, all right. Well, we can call it a night. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, we will uh, see everyone next week for next week's Father the Father. Okay.